Anything else? Thanks all so much. I appreciate it. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Brian. Appreciate that. I don't know if all of you remember, but uh, um, we had a power outing about oh, eight years ago, ten years ago. The power was out here in Evansville and down in Kentucky and things. And if you remember, you had to revert back to the 1700s or 1800s where there was no infrastructure, no electricity, plumbing work, but no electricity. And you had to go through what our uh, original people, our pioneers did at that time. And the same would happen if you didn't have CBs when you uh, attack an island or attack uh, another country. Uh, it's nice to conquer it, but once you conquer it, then you have all the infrastructure to do. And that's what uh, Brian's uh, units did is build the infrastructure. And you think that's nothing, but look at the Marines and look at the Army when they sit with all those bugs around them. They can't communicate with each other. They have none, none of the niceties you have, but the, uh, the uh, CBs did help with that. And it was a great invention for World War II for Admiral Morrell to get the CBs there. Now, I'm gonna back off in time here a little bit. I'm gonna talk a little bit about Industrial Revolution. I'm not gonna go too long on that, but I'm gonna tell you how important it is because Evansville really had an Industrial Revolution here. That's what this museum's all about, is about the Industrial Revolution of Evansville. And it was pretty significant. If you look at these dates up here, the real industrial revolution started in the world in uh, around the time of our country starting. The first steam engine was 1773, and that's what changed the whole world. It changed the world. Prior to that time, the world's space was far apart. Why was it far apart? Because you, as an individual, were dependent on the wind and the water to get somewhere. If you want to get to work faster, then any other way, you depend on the wind and the water, and they do whatever they want to do, and they're very dependent on the wills and wishes of Fossey our Almighty. But in 1773, when the steam engine was created, man began to, ha began to have power over space. And so the first thing that came out after many, many years of experimentation was, as you see up here, agriculture, we were all agricultural people here in the United States and all other countries, but all of a sudden, what are you gonna use? You're gonna try to build some tractors and build some things with that steam engine. So all of a sudden, textiles and tractors and those types of things became important in the early 1800s. And so you see that in time, then you get the steamships and the railroads, the golden stake that joined our country was 1859. You could. As a woman, you could go from the East Coast to the West Coast without getting jumped on the stagecoach or something else. As a man, you could too, and you could get there. There would be a predictable time to get from the East to West Coast. So this was the creation of the Industrial Revolution. It's what makes all this happen that we see here, and this got better and better with time. So as you see here, it changed the culture. It changed the urban society. We were all really farmers, gatherers and farmers at that time. Next slide, Brian, if you can find it. Okay. So then, what about war? This place that we're creating is a war, Evansville Wartime Museum. So when did industry first happen? The Industrial Revolution affected the Crimean War way back before the, our Civil War. Then our Civil War occurred. In our Civil War, lots of things happened during that time these types of explosives, railways, telegraphs. Next slide. If you look at the our American Civil War, if you go trace what Lincoln did last part on their telegraphs, he would sit and check the telegraph every day. Like you're checking your internet, checking your phone. He had to tell her if he'd go across from the White House and go to the telegraph, and he would find out what the generals were saying. So that helped communication. Railroads at that time. The North had 22,000 miles of railroads. The South had only 9,000 miles of railroads but that helped things happen. Balloons, submarines, rifles, mini bullets, all that stuff started peak, getting more important in the Civil War. Next slide, Brian. And so about 1870, you call it the second Industrial Revolution. Then we started getting steel. 
we started really making things happen. You've heard of all the Carnegie libraries here, the Father of Steel. And Carnegie, he helped with all the telegraphs in 1862 to 1865. Little Carnegie helped with Lincoln's telegraph type of thing. Lots of miles of telegraph to communicate. Communication is so important. And this is what happened. And every one of these machines I'm showing you was in one of these factories in Evansville. Not at that time, but over the next century, we became very good at this. We talked last week about Bucyrus here. We had a convention here and they had 50 people from Bucyrus here. They had most of those machines there in their industry. And lots of these things happened at Evansville, at the Whirlpool, Surveil, many other companies. So this stuff started getting better and better. So all of a sudden, here comes the next war. The next war is that. Uh, World War One. So these machines started being used by the Kaiser, started being used by the United States. Not the best machines in the world, but the, the, the tank became an important thing, the Jeep. Remember, horsepower was still, horses were still used in World War One. All of a sudden, we started seeing the importance of machines. The airplane, you know, invented in 1903, and all of a sudden, World War One, it became an effective tool of war. Some of them would just pass by and shoot with a gun at the, the enemy, but they were great in reconnaissance. If you look at the Wright Brothers book, what they, Germany and France said, this is a great tool of war. United States ignored the Wright Brothers for a while. And all of a sudden, these other countries saw the importance of just reconnaissance. And so airplanes became very important. If you just find that later, you gotta find it by the, that little, let me find that for you. <laughs> It'll keep talking to us. There we go. Okay, chlorine gas. The lady last night gave us a talk named Amber Gowan. She talked about World War One of 53 women, 53 to 80 women that came from Evans of World War One for nurses, and she talked very astutely about that. But chlorine gas, mustard gas, was a big deal in World War One, and actually Hitler had it World War Two. And I was in the Iraq or the Persian Gulf War, and we were scared to death that hit, or that Saddam Hussein was going to get us with that nitrogen mustard. And we saw people, she had pictures last night of some people that got the nitrogen mustard. And it's a terrible chemical. I use it with chemotherapy. It's called nitrogen mustard. Babe Ruth got some of that mustard because he had head and neck cancer. But you don't want it on your skin. And the nurses were exposed to that. But lots of things started happening in World War One. Next slide, please all of a sudden here's world war ii but prior to world war ii we had our biggest recession of our life we had from 1928 or 29 to 41 nobody had a job we had close to 15 percent unemployment in heaven so we had that back in 2007 2008 we had nine percent unemployment to ten percent and we were all crying and we only had it for one year they had it for a decade from 1929 to 41 but what did FDR do? What did the New Deal do? They went, did WPA around the country, and look at those things they did. The Tennessee Valley Authority, we got waterways, we are water power. They improved the railroads, they improved the electricity, they did grids, they improved our whole infrastructure. So when 41 happened, Brian Bretto met up, said on, you know, December 7th, we had infrastructure that was ready because we didn't just sit around and do nothing. We paid those people, we went in more in debt to create our infrastructure, but our infrastructure was strong. And the last thing there, so we were able to do our construction World War II more efficiently. The last thing we had, natural resources, and we had more than anywhere in the world. And we could get to them, partly because companies like Bisari Siri here in Evansville and other companies. Next slide. So look at this. Look at the natural resources we had. We had more than anybody else. You look at what had Japan. Japan didn't have enough. They're the size of Montana. Germany didn't have enough. Hitler was wrong. He was running out of oil. They didn't have the natural resources. We had everything. If you listen to that, the movie of, of when they went to Midway, the, the, the admiral from Japan had been to the United States. He says, you have woken a sleeping giant. What he meant by sleeping giant, it was our industrial infrastructure. And right here, while I'm talking about the Industrial Revolution, I'm talking about it because right here, what this museum's about is Evansville was number one per capita in the world, Germany and the United States, 
for workers for the war effort. 80,000 people working for the war effort. <coughs> the highest per capita in the world, right here in this little weapon. So, and that's what we're doing at this museum, trying to make people aware, trying not to lose our history. And that's what all the board's trying to do and all our volunteers. Next slide. So we became, at the end of the war, and for another 15 years from 45 to 60, we were the dominant factor. People have caught up with us, but for that period of time, Japan had to rebuild, Germany had to rebuild, but we were already there. So we changed from war industry to other type of industry, and look what we did. We dominated the world for a decade and a half, and we didn't have any competitors much, and we weren't gonna run out of raw, raw materials. So serendipitously see that happen. Next slide. This is partly what Bucyrus Siri did help dig things you don't think you can't run these companies without power and you got to go get coal to get power at that time you couldn't win it or run off the windmills next slide so i'm going to briefly go over and it's going to be nostalgia roll i'm not going to explain each slide but it's remember we had 80 companies here i'm only going to show you about 25 that were here and it's going to be pictures of what they look like in the past and i will briefly describe them but we've got pictures of over 80 different companies here. 330 products in World War II. Amazing things that happened there. Next slide. This is Republic Aviation. We are describing three big ones. This is the first one. That's how many employees in the business at the time. 8,000, but there were 35,000 when you include suppliers. Just like Toyota's got 5,000 on the route, but how many suppliers they got? They got a lot more suppliers. So they created jobs everywhere. How hard is it to make an airplane? We made one a plane every two and a half hours. Right now, Boeing makes one about every five hours. Henry Ford made one every hour but right out of a little blue building down the road here, one every 2.5 hours, 6,200 planes in a plane isn't easy to make. Next slide, Evansville Shipyard, 19,000 employees. Who our biggest employer right now is Deacon, the St. Mary's and, the, and uh, Toyota, 5,000 each. There's 19,000, that's a rat race there. We have memorabilia here, Mrs. Robinson, her mother, her dad was the electrician there because it was nights light lit all day, 24 hours, day and night. That thing, 19,000 employees. Every shift had to go in and out. If you remember Robert Stadium, you're going in those little carousels, you had to go through a carousel because your ID had to be checked. So this was a manhouse in the morning shift. You think 7,000 in, 7,000 out, 7,000 each shift. Next slide. That's Chrysler. Those were our three big blockbusters. You had those employees, that's 40,000 out of the 80,000. Chrysler was a blockbuster. It got the first contract January, mid-January of 42, making bullets. We never made a bullet. We have a whole display of the bullets and the guns, and, and Brian has talked about how you make, we got a movie out there, how you, all the different guns of World War II and the bullets we made here. Three billion bullets, one bullet, a little by the 45, about the end of my, end of my finger. Stretch it around the world, end on end, three times around, 25,000 times three, 75,000 75, miles of bullets made here in Evansville. If one of you could make 100 bullets a minute, it'd take you from the Revolutionary War till right now to be done. One person. That's how long it takes. That's how many bullets were made here in Evansville. And they made them, and they made them well here. And they also refurbished tanks. They also made incendiary bombs that burned Japan down in February, March, and April of 45. Next slide. I just went over the three major factories. This is Hoosier Cardinal. That man over there is Thomas Martin. He's the father of plastics in the United States. He was out there, so he died about, I don't know, 10 years ago or so, or his son died 10 years ago. Judy's right here, the daughter-in-law of that man right there. That man is the father of plastics. See that bubble top right over there? It's behind the machine there. You got a bubble top behind that big uh, motor there, but that bubble top, we had a birdcage before on the P-47s, and he's the father of plastic. He made the tops for that, for the P-47, also the B-24s. Father of plastics right here in Evans. Unbelievable, and that building's still over there on First Avenue. You see Hoosier Cardinal, next slide, please. That's Hoosier Lamps, and, and he still made plastic things for cars afterwards. Absolutely a genius. Went over to Germany, learned their trade of how to make plastics on the 30s, brought that art over here, and was used all over the United States, right here out of Evansville. And uh, she knew him. Tremendous man. Next slide. 
Briggs. Nobody knows the Briggs. They made all the wings. We made the wings not for just Evans. So we made 6,000 planes. That means that's 12,000 wings. But Republic Aviation was in Farmingdale, New York. We made all the wings for them, and we boxed them in a boxed them and put them on trains and sent them there. So we made about 32,000. We always made spares, too, because they didn't want to repair them on fuel. So we had about 32,000 wings just in that. And then after the war, we made, we made them as well. Briggs employed a lot of people here. Next slide. Hercules, big in Henderson, at the turn of the century was our biggest employee. Made car, uh, parts to cars. They had a contract with Sears, one of the biggest contractors ever, right over. Now they still got an industry over there in Henderson, but they, they'd make the back part of the cars or the, the little trucks called lorries in World War II. Next slide. George Mesker, steel, okay. Somebody in the old bits today owned George, George his name is um, Davist. He was an oil man, but he owns George Mesker Steel. George Mesker Steel has some, still some buildings in Evans, though the front part is made that steel. Very creatively done. And they didn't make the, it was more international steel, made a bigger part of the ship, but the gun parts and other parts were made for the, uh, the tanks. Mesker Steel was big in Evans Hill. Next slide. Bossy Globe, the biggest factory for furniture in the world at the turn of the century for the world word rights get all his money from lumber bossy globe if he wouldn't have died early bossy bossy in 1919 or so bossy globe is over by deacon the old deaconess midtown hospital that thing was a giant factory and helped make things for war ii wasn't quite as big time world war ii but at the turn of the century was a giant employer of evansville next slide george cook and sons the if you look at the 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 the, the the uh, LST. We've got a model out in the uh, When you put 15 Sherman tanks in LST and you turn them on to get off the get on the shore, and we're going to have that in the reenactment. The tanks aren't coming off the Higgins boat, but the the jeeps are. You open the front of an LST, all the tanks come out. Well, when they're inside, everybody get carbon monoxide poisoning. So they made all the the duct work for the LSTs and for other ships in the country right here at George Cook and Son. They still make duct work. One of our biggest employers, one of our biggest philanthropy people in Evansville. Next slide. Bernardin, you know where that is. That bottling company, they made things for World War II. All kinds of things, shell casings, other things. Next slide. Iglehart Brothers. Now, Iglehart's creating a new park right by Harrison High School. And it's the Iglehart Millery. If you ever look at any rich people in Indiana or in anywhere in the world, it was the mills because they got a little scrape off all the flour. So... Every every city in the United States, the millers are usually got money. If you go to go to um, Grandview, go to Tell City, go to Newburgh. Newburgh Breezius owned the mill there. K, a uh, person started with a C in Grandview. Anybody that has a mill has some money. But Iglehorts have been nice to our our city. They've got an, two Iglehort parks. They got one on first. Now they're going to have one by Harrison High School. But Iglehort Mills was big in World War II. You had to have food. Next slide. Blount, Blount Powell. I didn't know much about that, but they were big on farm equipment. Had to be big at that time. Next slide. Mm. Next. <laughs> Bucyrus Siri. We just talked about that. They help make things to make industry, to make industry, or to make uh, make helmets. And we have uh, Kevin Cook here in the front row. His dad, I forgot to say, but his dad was Bill Cook, and we've got him on the movies, and Bill Cook was an amazing individual. He was in World War II. He worked at he worked at uh, uh, Republic Aviation. Then he worked at the next building was in there, International Harvester. Then he worked at at, at uh, Whirlpool, and he worked at most of their things. He knew more than anybody about those three companies. Nobody that I know of did all that. But his dad, we got him on video. He, we lost him last year. We just lost his mom. But he was an amazing individual to be employed of all those things and also a veteran of World War II. And he could tell you about how big Whirlpool was. Remember, 10,000 employees. Gigantic here. Next slide. Mesker Steel. We've talked about that. 700 employees. Next slide. Me Johnson. 900 employees. Still here. We have a talker here named Donna, uh, Donna Bone, and she talks a lot about Me Johnson. They made a food product for World War II. They were a big part of World War II. Next slide. Vulcan Plows. That little, that little giant, the guy named Vulcan, that guy up, he ain't on top of there, but he's, maybe he's on top of there, but he's hanging around Evansville Summers. He's about 12 feet tall, 
but he's somewhere downtown. No, he's in the basement of the courthouse. Scare the heck out of you. Big, tall guy. Never split toilet seats. You're, you're rubber. Okay, when you sit on that toilet seat, most of them used to be wood. These are rubber. If you go to the Holman building, there's still some rubber ones there. But we've got them on the LST. And Mr. Eichamp, if you look at your foot pedal, when you put your brake on your on your car, that little rubber is made by I Can't Rubber. They're from up in Princeton. And they still have, they're going to give us some of those rubber seats. And this building, you can't see it, but it's Crawford Windows. That's right across from Bossy Field. So if you hit a home run, that's where never split toilet seats are because they made them out of rubber, real hard rubber. Keller Crescent, big, now they're out of here. But look at that big company here making labels. They made labels here forever. Next thing. National Furniture, big. You got some varial views right by Sterling Brewery now. Big, big company here making different things, furniture. Next slide. Cargus, oh my gosh, the class, it's a world-class furniture company. They made uh, uh, made uh, made uh, furniture for World War II t t times. But remember, this classiest furniture company in the country just went out of business here. I think they moved partly up to Michigan or so. Next slide. Fendrick Cigar, my grandmother worked there, right where Barry Plastics is, where Fendrick Cigar. Remember, cigarettes became popular in World War II, but there's still people like cigars. Next slide. General Cigar, that's the Girl Scout building downtown, right next to the YWC. Tons of cigars made there. Next slide. American Fork and Hole, right by uh, Germanium Manicor, right by that uh, greasy hamburger place. Um, Big, top. Big Top. Big Top, best brain sandwiches in the city. Right. Well. Close to the best, okay, in the top three for brain sandwiches. Top three. I'm gonna get to, back to that, back to that, back to that last one here. You know I go backwards? Uh, American Bargain Pole. Now there's a guy right, uh, his motorcycle used to be right, Mr. Bill Yunker, Phil Yunker, he'd always talk. We made, how many axes do you think there were in World War II? A lot of them, but we made the covers for the axes in World War II and the canteens. Okay, we made these hammers here and then Shane manufactured some of your mothers or grandparents worked at Shane. Shane made the covers to this and we made these these hatchets and the, tons of hatchets in World War II. Right here at a company right down the block by Reese Tire. Next slide. MG Meat, still around. Next slide. Anchor Supply, still here. Okay, made all kinds of things. Canteens, tents, you don't think we need it then? It was downtown, there was a 37 flood, but it moved out on the highway now. Next slide. Red Spot, it's only burned down about five times, but it's still here, okay? It's still here somewhere downtown. Next slide. Sunbeam, Mr. Carson, look at those cabinets over there, those square cabinets. Mr. Carson has all those little planes of World War II planes, and Mr. Carson, he's, his, he was named, uh, uh, I think Bill Carson, his son is still living and one of the daughters still lives in town. They had some beam plastics. The tops of your toothpaste, they they became rich on that little piece of plastic on top of your toothpaste. But they made things, they made bullets, and if you look, that Phil, Bill Yunker gave me a bullet on the bottom of it. One of them had S. It had S standing for made it some beam, the bullet here. And so it had S and 42, and then it had a C if it was made of Chrysler, but it had an S stand for some beam. So they made the bullets there too. Tell City, my mom and dad bought 150 chairs in Tell City Furniture for, they were like these, but they were all wood for $12 each, and they're still working. Nothing would still work today at $12. So Tell City was big at Tell City uh, chair. Next one. This, I have a handout. I'm going to give them all to you, but this is just a handout. I'll hand it. It's not in color, but it talks about all the employees and all the different companies we had in World War II. I've got about 15 that I Xerox. Next slide. And it just tells about the companies, Fendrick, the big ones, and then they got a red here, or a darker red. They got a, uh, they got one of those Army E, uh, Navy, where's that, where's that flag? Over there, the E award, they got, uh, that's because they did extra good work in World War II, only top 4%, and we had close to 35 E awards in World War II, which is a really big deal, only 4%. Some companies got five E awards. So I've got the list of those, and I think it'd be interesting for you just to see how important Evansville was. So luckily today, we've had a World War II CB, Vietnam era CB, and we've got a CB uniform from a gentleman that brought his dad's uniform here. Uh, we've got uh, a retired general. Remember, we only have we only had five flag ranks in this area ever. Admiral Kim over Henderson. We got Admiral Tuttle that's still living but is not doing very well from uh, from uh, from Hatfield. Admiral Point Dexter 
uh, and then General Evans, uh, Adam Poindexter is from Washington, Indiana, and Poindexter, or there's a guy from Evans named Marvin Evans, retired general, is deceased, and right here in the front row, uh, this gentleman, uh, stand up. Okay. Eric Schweiker, and he's a re he, Eric Schweiker, retired uh, general, and uh, he's in better shape than I am because he can still do 50 push-ups or a hundred. I mean, I was carrying furniture with him, and I was sweating and breathing hard, and he wasn't even breathing. I was breathing hard. I said, "What's going on here?" And then you think I'm kidding because we go to high schools and talk, and those little girls, kids say he can't do that, and they then they back off after a while. But they they think I'm lying. I'm not lying. And then Wayne got to talk to us. We've got a lot of veterans here. We've got Bill Schmidt, World War II, both Pacific and Atlantic, a retired dentist here. We've got Vietnam over here, Vietnam Air, Air, Air Force and Army. His wife both got... Okay. And then anybody else I've missed, veterans? Post-Vietnam. Post-Vietnam. Air Force. Got Air Force, Air Force, Air Force, Army. Commander Long, baby. Navy. All right. Navy. CB's all right. We got another CB. See that hat there? We got a CB. And we got USMC back there. He's got his shirt on. He's got a red car out front, if you know. It's a red Marine color. It's a red Marine. And then I'm Navy, so we got a little bit of balance here. We have no Army. Oh, my gosh. Oh, we got one. One arm back. Oh, two Army, two ground pounders. Yeah, this is big to beat us all up. So. Yeah, he can beat us up. Yeah, he probably beat us up. Okay, so. Okay, we got more functions. Tomorrow, next day, we got free ice cream for you. And then, uh, love to have you out. Tell your friends to come out. You don't want to come back again. Tell your friends to come back. It's open from 10 to 4 tomorrow and 10 to 4 on, on Sunday. And we'd like to have you here. And then we've got other things uh, uh, in on June 30th. Tickets are out there for sale on Top Old National Bank. And somebody's been there, and it is a number one event. But we need people there, $40 a head, okay? And you get two drinks. And we're going to monitor, okay? <laughs> Two drink tickets per person. You can't be exchanging all those drink tickets, okay? One guy had 10 tickets one day. He grabbed everybody's. We're going to watch it this year. Okay? He, was, he wasn't walking too well. I said, you get a cab. But anyway, that, we're not going to allow that this year. We're watching it. But I, I'm not worried about you. And good food's going to be sit down from Acropolis. No calories. And then uh, that's on the 30th. And you'll be able to see the whole air show and see that the LST, that the, we haven't got any Germans this year, so we just have Americans on the shore, and they're going to land the two Higgins, what I just heard this today, two Higgins, what's going to land on Dress Plaza, and the LST's going up and down, they'll shoot the guns and stuff, and it's the only LST left in the world. And you got two Higgins both coming off, the, off the, the Davits and coming into shore. That's on the 30th, and then we've got, uh, in October, we got something out here, Stephen, in October 20, October 3rd or 6th, is a hangar base. That means you can come in here and we're going to have music. So you'll be able to hear a lot and it'll be rock and roll or whatever. You <laughs> sit down dinner and we'd love to have you here or tell your friends if you don't want to come and just love to have all of you. And then we got something else in October. A car show. A car show. The whole car, car show is going to be around all these old cars and they're going to park outside and you can come in here and you may like that. We'd love to have you for all these events and then. Uh, we'd love to have you help volunteer. Uh, we'd love to have you be part of this process because if we let it go any more time, we're going to lose all our artifacts, and these artifacts are going to be displayed. We're just getting this place bigger and bigger every moment. Thank you for your time. Well, that, is this still working? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Dr. Mark is a hard act to follow, so I'm going to keep this real short and sweet. We do have box lunches for you over on the other side of the hall, but uh, now don't get too comfortable, doctor. We need uh, we need Mark and Brian and Wayne back up front, please. Wayne first. What this says is that the Evansville Wartime Museum recognizes uh, Mark Browning, Brian Bradhold, and Wayne Guerin for participation in Evansville Wartime Museum first anniversary events by presenting today's talk. It goes on to say this presentation supports the vision of Evansville Wartime Museum to become a rewarding and educational destination, illustrating our community's wartime legacies and for guests of all ages. So let's have a big round of applause. For this.